Welcome to our Surviving and Thriving Together series, Meet the Researcher session with Dr. Prashant Chidiboyna. Dr. Chidiboyna is an assistant clinical investigator in the neurosurgery unit for pituitary and inheritable diseases at the NIH. He earned his medical degree from Goa University and an MPH from Idaho State University. He completed his residency in neurosurgery at Louisiana State University. His lab studies neurosurgical disorders of the pituitary gland and disorders arising from inheritable tumor syndromes. His current work is focused on changing the outcomes of neurosurgical disorders through improved imaging. Dr. Chidibonia, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, I recognize that uh, I could be the first of many that will follow from the NIH uh, for this uh, series of uh, Meet the Researchers. Uh, so I'm definitely honored and, uh, and glad to be here, uh, to be given this opportunity to, to speak about the program that we run at the NIH. Um, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of dive into it and I'll explain a little bit about what the NIH uh, VHL program is all about, specifically the neurosurgical aspect of it. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the research aspects and where we are hoping to take some of these findings in the near future. And I will be happy to take any questions that you or your viewers may have. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, my, my name is Prashant Chidi Boyna and I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon by trade and I work at the NIH Clinical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, so the reason why the VHL Family Alliance and, um, uh, and uh, a lot of VHL patients know us is because historically we have been running what's known as a natural history study of von Hippel-Landau disease. Uh, specifically, we are looking at the neurological manifestations of von Hippel-Landau disease. Now, the original programs were started by Dr. Linehan looking at the kidney uh, tumors and then Dr. Oldfield uh, looking specifically at the neurological manifestations. And the NIH program has since then been um, run by Dr. Russ Lanzer. Um, and then most recently, I am the PI for the natural history program. When I say PI, I mean principal investigator. So the investigator that is responsible for, um, you know, taking care of the study subjects, as well as, um, looking at the data and coming up with new research projects. So that's my PI aspect, but I'm also a physician, you know, that's actually what I'm first. So I am a surgeon by trade. So I also uh, manage uh, von Hippel-Landau disease in not only the subjects, which are a part of the natural history study, but also patients that are either referred to us uh, because they have hemangioblastomas or endolymphatic sac tumors or other kind of tumors that need to be taken care of in the clinical setting. So there are really two aspects to the VHL program uh, of, that is run by the neurosurgery department. One is a research aspect and one is the clinical aspect. So I would like to talk about both of them. Um, so talking about the research aspect first, the research aspect of the VHL program in the neurosurgery uh, department here is centered around the natural history study. So essentially what we have is 250 subjects. So notice how I changed from subject to patient. So, you know, I'll try to keep that separation. So we have 250 subjects that are a part of this natural history study. And we are charged by the, you know, IRB, as well as you know, other oversight uh, folks to treat our subjects in a manner that's safe. And that means that we are not really investigating any devices or drugs. We are just managing our patients as they would be managed in the real world. Real world being basically anywhere outside of the clinical center. So as a part of that, we provide um, our subjects in the natural history trial with annual imaging, which is um, MRI of the brain and spine with and without a gadolinium contrast. In addition, we have clinic visits with neurosurgery department and if needed clinic visits with um, our ENT colleagues. So this 
basically what we are trying with this natural history study is generating a large data set. And that data set is such, we want to be able to see our patients and uh, specifically the subjects that are part of the natural history study and be able to answer the question, well, what happens when our patients get von Hippel-Landau disease? How does von Hippel-Landau disease change their lives? You know, do, is there a way to predict which patients will have uh, higher tumors or more tumors or which patients will have fewer tumors? So some of those have been answered over the years by looking at the large series that Dr. Lanzer was looking at and, and published um, uh, you know, a few papers on that. And there are some key insights in that, that we learned, which we are using now in managing our patients on the clinical side as well. So one of the key insights that we gained by doing this large natural history study is unlike, uh, let's say kidney tumors, we don't have a size cutoff uh, for intervening. What, what we are looking for in the neurosurgical aspect is essentially any tumor that causes problems of any sort is the one that we should be, uh, we should be targeting with some sort of treatment, any sort of treatment. So how do we define the problem? The problem is defined by what the tumor could be causing by either growing uh, in size, by creating a cyst around it, or by creating a lot of swelling around the tumor. So any of these three, um, you know, of the, um, any of these uh, three uh, findings can lead to new problems. And the new problems that these tumors can cause essentially are completely dependent on the location. So if they're in the cerebellum, they'll cause certain kinds of symptoms like balance problems and dizziness. If they're in the spinal cord, they'll cause weakness or tingling and numbness. You know, if they're in the brainstem, they'll cause swallowing problems or hiccups. So it almost doesn't matter what those symptoms are. We just need to be able to know uh, where the tumor is and how the tumor has been behaving. So even, if, and because of, because of the differences in the way these tumors uh, cause problems, so to speak, um, there's no size cut off and the sizes are different. Sometimes cerebellar tumors get really large before we even say that something needs to be done. While all it takes sometimes for a spinal cord tumor is to grow maybe a millimeter or two and then it starts causing problems. So that is a critical part of decision-making and we learned that from the natural history study, essentially. And we learned that by withholding surgery from just any patient that has a growing tumor, we will actually spare our patients extra surgical interventions that may not be um, timely. Um, we, we can spare them that time that they can spend with their families without needing to be in the hospital, without having to undergo surgery. So that's a critical insight that we gain. Now, that was one example of how we utilize that data set that we generated by looking at our patients over uh, long periods of time with, you know, by performing their MRIs, by looking at their clinical stories in our clinic and looking at the data that was generated by the hearing test, et cetera. Another example that I'd like to point out is um, when we have our patients in natural history, we also um, offer them surgery through our clinical side. And sometimes uh, when our patients undergo surgery, um, we are able to ask a topical questions, topical meaning which could be of the correct you know, topic at that time. For example, let's say if a researcher is in this, uh, interested in um, you know, understanding how a new drug could be affecting uh, VHL tumors, when we, when we have samples that are, um, so to speak, or, you know, so, so to speak, not being used by the pathologist in order for diagnosis of hemangioblastomas, then researchers can use that extra tissue uh, for conducting research studies. So that's a, another critical way by which um, our natural history study, uh, you know, allows for patients to be evaluated for surgery. And then some of that tissue can be used to ask some bench, uh, some basic science questions in the bench. And, and the three examples of that in the recent past that we have been slowly taking forward has been the first is looking at the effect of octreotide, which is a somatostatin uh, agonist on, um, uh, on hemangioblastoma specifically. 
um, it doesn't seem to have um, any effects on kidney tumors for reasons of the kind of receptors that it carries. And number two would be looking at the effect of varinostat. It's a cancer drug which has been used before in kidney in skin cancers. And we just completed a study and we are actually writing, we have written up the study and we have sent it out for publication. Uh, and we are hoping to hear back from uh, the publishers if it gets accepted. And uh, the VHL community is going to hopefully see the results of this study very soon. And as soon as we have um, uh, some sort of, um, you know, a sense of where this is going to go, we will definitely reach out to VHL Family Alliance and, um, you know, uh, and share our results. <clears throat> and then the third one, uh, which is still in the initial phases, is looking at the effect of a common blood pressure drug, propranolol, on hemangioblastomas. And again, we have some tentative uh, uh, data that was generated from <clears throat> our laboratory studies using the tissues from our patients with VHL, uh, but it needs a larger clinical trial, which may be in the offing uh, very soon. So those are the research activities. Um, a small, small snapshot of research activities that uh, the neurosurgery VHL group is undertaking actively. Now, on the clinical side, uh, we have, um, you know, we also are proud to call ourselves a center of excellence for taking care of our von Hippel-Landau disease patients. Uh, the hemangioblastomas in these various difficult locations that our patients have, cerebellum, brainstem, spinal cord, sometimes even in other spots, uh, we are able to offer uh, a surgical treatment, which I feel is at least at par <clears throat> with any large uh, surgical, um, academic surgical center. And the reason why we're able to offer that kind of a surgical service is because although the NIH Clinical Center is not a large center, uh, but it's very focused. And this is a big part of what I do. This is a big, taking care of VHL patients is a big, big part of my job, about 50% of my cases, my surgical cases are actually von Hippel and that disease. So by volumes, actually, we do see a lot more. And that actually translates to better care because not only am I not nervous each time I see a von Hippel and that disease patient, but I feel, you know, a certain degree of cautious confidence that maybe, maybe I can just take care of these patients well. And not just that, but I have a great support system. You know, my nurses, my OR staff, my ICU folks, you know, and my floor nurses, everyone's very well aware of how to take care of von Hippel and disease and the other problems that can arise from that, you know. So for example, everyone's aware that we should be looking at, you know, Mets and cats before we offer, you know, those kind of like small things that really make a big difference, you know. Um, so that's the clinical side. So overall that accounts for a pretty, uh, a very high volume of surgery that we are, that we can perform safely um, at the NIH Clinical Center. So that's, that's the big spiel. Uh, so let me talk briefly about um, uh, COVID-19 and how it's affecting our operations. And this is a topic that was suggested by Josh uh, as we were chatting offline before we actually got started. So uh, this COVID-19 epi epidemic has been, pandemic has been very, very unfortunate. It has affected all aspects of our lives. Um, it has affected all aspects of research and clinical care at the um, NIH Clinical Center. So in short, um, all research activities have stopped. Um, and this is a mandate that has come from the scientific directors of the various institutes. Um, but the clinical activities still continue. Uh, in fact, uh, three weeks ago, um, I had uh, to perform two surgeries on two of my von Hippel and that disease patients because it was not something, you know, they had tumors that were acting up and it was not something that we could postpone and wait for the COVID-19 pandemic to die down. So uh, fortunately for us, they did both really well and they're discharged and so far they seem to be doing well despite um, having undergone surgery um, during the pandemic. Um, so if there is a clinical necessity, uh, if our patients are suffering from new and severe problems, we are still able to offer clinical care. However, um, in order to ensure that we are not exposing our nurses, our patients, um, and our care providers 
uh, to COVID-19, we have been asked not to perform any research studies. So we are not doing any laboratory studies right now. So my lab is shut down, essentially. Um, I just went and checked on it today make sure that the freezers are working and we haven't lost any tissues and those kind of things. But, but we're not actively doing any research um, at this point. The only research we've been doing is I've, I've been holding lab meetings every day. Uh, so our, my folks are working from, from home and uh, all we can do is uh, work on the data that's already been generated. So that's the extent of that. Now, in terms of restarting activities, I really, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I don't know when we will restart uh, uh, the actual clinic visits as a part of the natural history study. Um, although we've been hearing from the, excuse me, um, uh, we've been hearing from our leadership that um, there's a big push to start allowing uh, televisits with all of our patients. And that actually may work out in the near future. The NIH being a federal um, agency, uh, unfortunately, we are not able to use Zoom or Google Hangouts um, for these televisits. Uh, I think we are limited in the kind of vendors that we can actually use. Um, I'm hearing things and I can't confirm it. I'm hearing things that it'll be something uh, like Microsoft Teams uh, and it'll be, um, it'll be in a way that's secure and we can actually ensure confidentiality of our patients that we are uh, managing and treating through televisits. So that's uh, basically brand new. I just heard about it yesterday. And that's the extent of the information regarding restarting clinical activities is concerned. Um, so I'll take a break here and um, see if you have any questions, Josh, or if you can um, uh, let me know if I need to talk about something else. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a question. Uh, how did you get interested in inheritable tumor disorders like VHL? Uh, blind luck, basically. Um, you know, as, as in many things uh, in life, it's not just luck, but I, I feel like I was prepared for it. So, so Dr. Ed Oldfield, he's, he's a stalwart surgeon. He was a stalwart surgeon and he's a well-known um, academic giant, so to speak. And he, he's a but what, one of the things that, you know, our VHL patients may or may not know is that he's also, he was also a master surgeon. You know, he was a surgeon that, that people like me just look up to. You know, he, he was just, his skills that, you know, he was able to kind of show us his results and some of the videos that he created of treating von Hippelin disease patients was just remarkable. It was so different from anything else I'd ever seen uh, during my training. So Dr. Oldfield visited the uh, Shreveport Neurosurgery Program as a visiting professor, and he showed us some of the work that he was doing. It was just unbelievably impressive. So as soon as that happened, I sought out an opportunity um, for what's called as a translational research fellowship at the NIH Clinical Center. I was hoping to spend uh, one to two years learning some translational uh, lab projects, as well as the ability to uh, learn some of the surgical techniques that Dr. Oldfield and Dr. Lanzer were performing. And that actually worked out really well. Um, you know, they liked me for some reason, they accepted me. And then when Dr. Lanzer was ready to move out to bigger and better places, uh, this was an opportunity that I was able to fill, um, you know, as I stepped in. So we have another question here. Uh, how do you know if hiccups are related to brain hemangioblastomas or just from laughing Persistence, you know, just one word. Um, all of us have hiccups. I have hiccups, you know, my kids have hiccups and, you know, and my patients have hiccups, whether they have von heppel lindau disease or just some other pituitary problem or, but it's persistence. You know, the one thing that tips us off in the direction that there is a true pathology that could be causing hiccups, uh, and specifically brainstem hemangioblastomas and brainstem tumors are known to cause hiccups is if the hiccups are persistent and they don't, they don't go away or if they keep coming back every day. Now that could be, could be, uh, now again, I don't wanna scare people, that could be a sign that this is something that we should be looking into a little more carefully. Thank you. Um, so um, what do you think, here's another question, what do you think, uh, based on your research and, and your take on the uh, research environment in general, 
Uh, how will neurosurgery surgery look in the next five to 10 years as it relates to VHL? I, I, I'm hoping that some of the work that we are doing with these novel drug targets, as well as some of the work that NCI folks have been doing with the Peloton trial, hopefully uh, will result in reducing the need for surgery, really, you know, because even though uh, this is my trade. This is what I do for a living. And, you know, but I, I recognize how hard this is on my patients. You know, um, each time my patients undergo surgery, I feel that, you know, they, it's like relearning, uh, you know, walking all over again sometimes, you know, so I, I recognize how hard it is. And we are desperately, desperately trying to find opportunities to improve the way we treat von Hippelandau disease and, you know, neurofibromatosis too, um, which is uh, the other uh, multiple tumor syndrome that I take care of without resorting to surgery. And um, it's very hard to predict, but if some of these drugs are able to show efficacy uh, in controlling this chronic condition, um, then I feel that neurosurgery would change in, in a way that would lead us to performing fewer surgeries, surgeries only for very, very fast growing tumors or the tumors that basically broke through and are not responding to the drug anymore when they had responded before, um, or maybe tumors that suddenly presented with some big cysts. So I think that's the way I'm seeing a change. Um, unfortunately, we, are, we don't have the silver bullet yet. That will ensure no surgery um, at least not in the three or three to five year span. I would love to be wrong though. I would love to be wrong. Um, but that's my take on it. Uh, just a, a couple more questions. Uh, what advice would you have for a person with VHL who uh, is trying to discern whether their symptoms might be related to VHL or just related to something totally separate? You know, over the years, I've taken care of hundreds of VHL patients, and one of the things that I've that I've realized is, um, you know, well, a few things I've realized. One, one of them is that my patients are extremely resilient. You know, I mean, they're able to weather, you know, the constant storm that VHL brings to their lives. And as a part of that, I've also realized that a lot of my patients are able to build like these inbuilt filters into into the into their minds where they're able to filter out some of the more common and minor things where they recognize that well it seems odd but it's probably not related to VHL and sometimes that intuition actually works best okay now that's a very frou frou hand wavy answer to the question okay now there's a there's a better there's a better answer with there's a more doctor-like answer. And that answer is like, really, again, it goes back to the same thing as hiccups, severity and persistence, you know? If a symptom, you know, so like if you were to draw a line, right? This is time and this is how bad the symptom is, right? Actually, let me draw that. So here we are. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So let's say this is symptom. This is time. If symptoms are going like this, that's because of VHL. But if symptoms so this is my attempt. <laughs> Can you see that? So if the symptoms are rising, 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 they don't ever go down. And they keep, seem to keep getting worse. So, you know, the last two weeks have been much worse than last two months and which has been much worse than last two years. And that could be VHL in general. While symptoms that seem to, you know, kind of ebb and flow a little bit, that's probably not VHL. So that's a simple generic answer to a very complicated question, actually. And this is by no means, you know, I just want to be very clear. This is not medical advice. I'm just, you know, I'm just, basing this answer based on my experience in treating VHL patients and what they have reported to me. And uh, one last question. What, uh, what do you do for fun outside of the office? 
<laughs> you know, I, I was telling Josh that I've got young kids. So, uh, you know, going out with kids is, is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, both of them have learned how to ride bikes. So that's a lot of fun. Um, in order to maintain sanity, I run. Um, you know, there's a lot of running trails around uh, Bethesda, you know, so I live very close to the, uh, to the clinical center, actually. So there's a bunch of running trails here. It's a great opportunity to engage in physical activities and then, um, you know, read. Sometimes I do get time to read uh, things other than just medicine and research. So those are, in a nutshell, the things that I'd like, you know, like to do. So family, reading, and um, running. Well, thank you. Uh, by the way, that you've a uh, uh, hello from Dr. Meet T. Roche. Just wanted to say hi. Hi. Uh, but Dr. Chidibunya, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to join us uh, and for all the work you do for the VHL community. It's it's obvious how much you care and uh, and we really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Josh. Uh, as I was saying to Josh, I am uh, available for further sessions if needed. You know, we'll Let's, let's hope that this COVID-19 thing is over soon enough. And if not, then we'll just have to rely on Zoom a lot more. So thanks again. And, right. uh, and for everybody else, uh, please join us for more Meet the Researcher sessions and other surviving and thriving together events. You can find the calendar of events at vhl.org slash together. And until then, stay safe and have a nice day.